the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The 1995 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures on the double life of RNA will be presented by Dr. Thomas R. Check, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, distinguished professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, and 1989 Nobel laureate in chemistry. The second lecture will discuss RNA as an enzyme, discovery, origins of life, and medical possibilities. And now to introduce our program, the president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Pernell W. Chopin. Welcome back to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for the second in this year's Holidays Lecture on Science. Our speaker today is Dr. Tom Check, distinguished professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. A few weeks ago, Dr. Check was here in town down at the White House where he received the National Medal of Science from President Clinton. You've already heard that he's a wonderful teacher. You will probably not be surprised to know that he teaches an introductory course in chemistry at his university. He's also trained dozens of graduate students, worked with high school science teachers, and especially encouraged minorities in pursuit of scientific careers. He and many other scientists are following a long tradition of mentoring young people like you. Why do we do this? Because it, the scientific community expects you to take up our work and carry it on into the future. It is you who will make the discoveries in the next century. We hope that you'll take inspiration from Dr. Check's talk. There's a revolution going on in medical research. Molecular biology is going to change all of our lives, not just in medicine, but in agriculture and many other fields. We hope that you'll be inspired by what you hear today. And some of you will pursue careers in science and per perhaps one day be giving lectures such as these yourself. I know that Tom will endorse that. He will now give his second lecture his title, RNA is an Enzyme Discovery, Origins of Life, and Medical Possibilities. Tom Check. Thank you, Pernell. You can see that I've changed sweaters. I've got my historian's sweater on now because I would like to take a step back and answer a question which I know is always in students' minds, which is how do you find out this kind of stuff anyway? You know, how, do you, how, how does one uh, make a new discovery? And before I address that question and then also talk about some of the unexpected spin-offs that came from the research, things that certainly weren't on our minds at the times we were doing the experiments, I'd like to just uh, review or recap a little bit from the last lecture. Uh, so remember that we're focusing on ribonucleic acid, or RNA, this uh, intermediary in the transfer of information from DNA to RNA to protein, because it shares with DNA the ability to uh, transmit biological information, but also shares with protein the ability to speed up, in a very specific way, biochemical reactions. And that, um, we're used to thinking of a biological catalyst as being a protein enzyme, active site cleft, that has a uh, disposition of chemical groups in the active site of the protein that recognize and bind out of all of the myriad of tiny molecules in a cell. It's specific for binding one sort of molecule, in this case a small sugar, because it has a surface in that active site cleft, which is complementary to the surface of the small substrate molecule. What do I mean by complementary? Well, if you think about uh, a, a lump of wet or soft clay, and if you put a rock or, a, or your fist or something in that clay and then remove it, you now have a surface which is the complement of the object that you pressed into that clay. So that sort of physical shape that wherever there's a bulge in the small molecule, there's an indentation in the active site of the enzyme is one kind of complementarity, but there can be other kinds as well. For example, it could be in terms of the charge 
character. Where there's a positive charge on the substrate, there may be a corresponding negative charge on the active site of the uh, catalyst to, to bind the substrate molecule and recognize it relative to all of the other uh, molecules that would be present in the cell. And then having recognized it, the enzyme is able to promote a particular chemical transformation of that small molecule. Uh, and it does that by uh, stabilizing something called a transition state, which is a halfway point between the uh, original molecule before the reaction and the products. And by stabilizing that halfway point, it actually speeds up the uh, course of the, of the transformation. So that's been known about protein enzymes for a long time. And then we went on to say that ribonucleic acid because of its single-stranded nature and sometimes taking advantage of not only base pairing between the strands as seen in tRNA, but also taking advantage of that 2' OH group, which is 2' just specifies a particular position on the nucleic acid chain. There's that extra oxygen atom, and that provides an additional handle, which can be used for folding of an RNA. Now, this transfer RNA molecule by itself is not known to have any catalytic activity. But when we move to uh, molecules from nature that do act as biological catalysts, we can see even in these two-dimensional views. So this is a flat sort of a road map to the structure of the RNA. It shows the first level of folding where A's are paired with U's and C's are paired with G's to form helical regions. So the the linear chain folds by base pairing and then uh, additionally will fold into a three-dimensional structure, which I'll talk about in a minute. And we know of uh, quite a few varieties of catalytic RNAs found in nature. The one I'm going to be talking about shown on the upper left-hand corner, the so-called group one introns. There are now uh, 325 or so, last time I checked, examples of this sort of RNA catalyst that has been found in nature in everything from plants to multicellular animals to unicellular uh, protozoa, such as the tetrahymena that you may have seen out in the lobby uh, on, the, on the microscopes that we have set up, um, also found in, in plants and in fungi. So very widespread in nature, uh, hundreds of examples. Uh, group two introns, uh, not as many examples found so far, but also rather widespread in both uh, bacteria and in higher organisms. Uh, this ribonuclease P, which is studied by Sidney Altman and his co-workers at Yale University and Norman Pace and his uh, students at the University of, at Indiana University. Uh, this is a, an RNA molecule which interacts with a specific protein to catalyze a, a specific maturation process that results in a, a functional transfer RNA molecule. So again, it's RNA acting on RNA. Uh, but even though this RNA works in concert with a protein or proteins in the cell, it's the RNA part that very clearly contains the active site in the catalytic center. Here are a couple of pathogenic RNAs, uh, one of them that infects plants and another one that infects uh, humans, the hepatitis delta virus RNA. Again, a folded RNA structure that in these cases, uh, once it folds up, mediates cleavage of a portion of itself, a, a disruption of the polynucleotide chain at the position shown by the arrow here or the arrow over here. So this is just to give you a, a quick overview that these catalytic RNAs are folded RNAs. And if we now go from these two-dimensional representations to a model of a three-dimensional representation, I think you can see that we're at a point where the uh, RNA catalyst shown here in the reddish color embracing this uh, nucleic acid substrate doesn't look that much different from a far off view from a, a globular protein enzyme with an active site cleft holding onto its substrate. This particular picture always reminds me of Godzilla climbing the Empire State Building 
uh, the Godzilla is the RNA catalyst, and this other piece of RNA shown as the colored helix is the, is the Empire State Building part, is the substrate that it is acting upon. So how did we uh, then come to this notion that RNA could be a catalyst? Well, we weren't searching for it. And for many years, I, I uh, declined to tell this story because I was more interested in telling recent results from our laboratory's research than uh, ancient, what seemed like ancient history. But I realized that it was important for students to get a sense of how new things are discovered in molecular biology or, for that matter, in any science. I think that when you read a textbook, you often get the idea that the scientist is standing over here looking at a discovery to be made out there somewhere and designs a series of experiments to march from the idea to make the discovery, at which point it's written down in the textbooks. And I used to say that only in some areas of, th of physics uh, are things ever so clear and clear cut when some physicist friends assured me that nothing of any interest in physics had ever been discovered in such an easy way either. Much more common is for discoveries to involve a big dose of serendipity. Now serendipity I think was best defined by Louis Pasteur who said that chance favors only the prepared mind. He of course said it in French, not in English. But the idea is that there is luck involved, there is chance involved, but that if you don't have the right training, the right education and experience and laboratory skills, but also an open mind and the right um, mental disposition to be open to the, chance, the, the chances that or the luck that falls in your way, then you won't make these discoveries. So it's this interplay between chance and between your, your training and scientific intuition, which is always very much the part of scientific discovery, as you'll see. Uh, our work started out with this ciliated protozoan. Protozoan means it's a single-celled animal. The cilia are these hair-like projections which move the uh, organism through the pond water. So this is found in freshwater ponds throughout the world. And we chose to study this organism because it shared with human cells the division of uh, the cell into a nucleus where the DNA is kept and the cytoplasm where protein synthesis takes place. So it's a eukaryotic cell and therefore a good model for eukaryotic molecular biology in general. But these cells are as easy to grow as bacteria. You can grow a flask full of millions of cells quite cheaply and easily. And the choice of this particular organism was determined by the fact that within this large so-called macronucleus, there were 10,000 identical copies of a particular gene all doing the same thing, producing ribosomal RNA to become part of the ribosome at the same time. And that was an unusual feature to have so many copies of the same gene that we thought it would be an excellent system for studying the process called transcription. Transcription uh, involves the copying of the information present in the double helix of DNA into an RNA copy. This occurs when RNA polymerase, which is a protein enzyme, sits down at a particular sequence of nucleotides along the DNA that it recognizes and is, uh, moves in the direction shown by the arrowhead, makes an RNA copy of this part of the double helix, opening the double helix transiently as it goes, and then there's a stop sign over here, which is the place where there's a, a, another signal built into the system, which causes the polymerase to, to uh, jump off of the DNA at that point. Now, in the process of trying to studying the copying of DNA into RNA, we found, as uh, Joe Gall and, and his coworkers at uh, Yale University had also found it, a, at uh, a, year late, a year earlier in a related system that this DNA was interrupted by a stretch of uh, what's shown here as green DNA. This is a, a non-coding sequence called an intervening sequence 
or an intron. And these had been uh, the general phenomenon that genes in eukaryotic organisms often have their coding sequences interrupted by stretches of non-coding DNA had been uh, found a couple of years earlier by Phil Sharp and his co-workers at uh, MIT and also a group uh, led by Rich Roberts at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories in New York. And so this wasn't a new finding, and it was already known by, uh, by then that the RNA polymerase, which copies DNA into RNA, doesn't do anything different when it encounters one of these stretches of non-coding DNA, that it copies it right along with the flanking coding regions to give the uh, precursor, to give a precursor RNA, which then is subsequently spliced uh, Points X and Y have to be broken and rejoined to give the mature or functional form of the RNA molecule. So if you want to study this first step of gene expression, you, maybe you don't need to worry about these interruptions in the DNA. However, when we set out to set up a uh, test tube system for watching the copying of DNA into RNA, we found that not only was that process occurring, but that this subsequent RNA splicing step was also occurring outside of the cell in the test tube. And this uh, was a very intriguing finding because at this point, which was about 1979, there was only one other laboratory, that of John Abelson in Southern California, that had ever seen RNA splicing take place outside of a cell in a test tube. And there were a hundred laboratories or more throughout the world studying transcription, but a lot of interest and not much knowledge about this subsequent step in the expression of a gene. So we decided to allow ourselves to get sidetracked from our original goal of studying DNA makes RNA and to instead engage in some studies of trying to understand RNA splicing. In particular, we wanted to find the enzymatic machinery that would cut and paste the RNA in this very specific way. Out of some 7,000 nucleotides, only two sites were chosen as sites of this rearrangement, always at the, exactly the same place. And clearly a process that took place with this much specificity and with this much rate acceleration over the normal rate of cutting, the spontaneous rate of cutting of an RNA chain, uh, which would be very slow, must be catalyzed. And it was known that all catalysts were protein enzymes. And so, of course, we were going to find the protein enzyme that was responsible for, or, or maybe enzymes, there might be several of them, that were responsible for this process. Now, when a biochemist uh, wants to purify the catalytic apparatus responsible for a particular transformation, you start out with the molecule prior to it having uh, undergone the reaction, in this case unspliced RNA that still contains the intron as well as the flanking sequences which are sometimes called exons, they're on the outside, they're the mature sequences which the cell is going to end up retaining. So we took this unspliced RNA and mixed it together with a nuclear extract from the tetrahymena cells because we knew that our splicing was taking place in the nucleus. The idea was to mix these together in a test tube in the presence of small molecules which are found in all cells. The critical ingredients in this molecular recipe turned out to be uh, magnesium ion and guanosine triphosphate, itself one of the building blocks of RNA. So this is the G that's found in uh, ribonucleic acid. And after mixing these together, uh, we would use gel electrophoresis to separate the unspliced RNA from the splicing products. The way that this works is that you make uh, essentially a slab of a material that's very similar to jello and then place the, the solution containing the molecules at the top, apply a potential field difference, and, uh, and in the uh, presence of this electric field, the negatively charged 
ribonucleic acid is, uh, goes away from the negative pole towards the positive pole, and as it goes down, uh, small, small molecules are able to move much more quickly uh, as they're sieved by the gel matrix than the large molecules. Well, the first time that we did this experiment, it worked, which is unusual in molecular biology or any kind of science, that when we mix these molecules together in the presence of the nuclear extract, we were able to see the excised intron uh, being, re being released, and so that was uh, uh, very exciting. But rather perplexing was the fact that in a control experiment in which one of the components of the um, splicing reaction had been left out, namely the nuclear extract had not been added, we saw just as much splicing taking place. Well, that was uh, a very unexpected result. Our first thought was that we had somehow uh, mixed up the test tubes and uh, needed to repeat the experiment, which we did a number of times and found that very reproducibly, simply mixing the unspliced RNA together with these small molecules was sufficient for splicing to take place. So where is the catalyst in this system? Well, as the director of this uh, at the time very young laboratory, it was up to me to come up with a hypothesis that would explain the results. If you're taking notes, which I see many of you are, you might want to not take notes on this particular slide because this hypothesis turns out to be completely wrong. But that's not bad in science. As long as a hypothesis f follows naturally from what you know at the time, as long as it can explain the phenomenon and is consistent with, you know, the laws of chemistry and physics, doesn't uh, seem like it's an impossibility, and especially important, as long as it's testable, then one can make a great deal of progress. You test the hypothesis. If it turns out to pass the test, then you retain the hypothesis, perhaps subjecting it to even more rigorous testing. If it fails the hypothesis, you've still, if it fails the test, you've still learned something, and you can either discard or appropriately revise the hypothesis, and in that uh, rather zigzag pathway, make progress understanding a system. So the idea here was maybe the RNA, shown as the solid line, that we were extracting from the tetrahymena cells wasn't really pure RNA. Maybe a protein splicing enzyme shown here as the faint dashed line, you can see I wasn't too sure of the hypothesis, maybe that was coming along for the ride when we isolated the RNA from tetrahymena. So then when we mixed this molecule together with the uh, guanosine and the, the magnesium ion, a reaction which had been initiated really inside the cell was simply uh, playing itself out in the test tube. So maybe there was a protein enzyme involved as we had originally supposed. Well, how do you test this sort of hypothesis? Well, biochemists know lots of uh, good ways to inactivate proteins. And so we applied some of these. For example, proteins, un their chains unravel in the presence of detergent. That's why you add detergent when you wash your clothes to remove prote proteinaceous stains. And so we added detergent to this uh, RNA, and lo and behold, when we added the guanosine and the magnesium, the splicing continued. Well, that's very unusual for a protein. Well, then we decided to boil the RNA. So high temperature, again, is denaturing for protein chains. Again, you use often high temperature when you're washing clothes. And we boiled the solution, and when we reduced the temperature back to room temperature, added the small molecules, splicing again continued unabated. Again, a seemingly unusual property for a protein. Well, we now thought maybe this has to, you, now you revise the hypothesis a little bit. Perhaps this is a very unusual protein that's resistant to both boiling and detergent. Maybe we'll, we'll add detergent and boil in the presence of detergent. We did that and it had no effect on the reaction. At that point, we bought uh, large quantities of very nonspecific proteases, which are enzymes that hydrolyze or degrade other protein molecules, and added these uh, 
enzymes, which are also present in enzyme-activated laundry detergents. You can see there's a theme here. It's just like doing laundry. Um, when we added these proteases to our starting material, again, it had no effect on splicing. So now the hypothesis that there was a uh, splicing enzyme pre-associated with the RNA was not looking very good. And this brings us to uh, the Christmas of 1981, when Paula Grabowski, one of my graduate students, gave me uh, this as a Christmas gift. I don't know if you can see it from where you are. So uh, fortunately, we were able to think of something a little more scientific than picking the petals off the daisy to resolve the question of whether there was a protein there or not. But we had to have some positive evidence. We knew that if we simply had negative evidence that the, uh, that the activity was resistant to a series of treatments that normally destroy protein, that this would provide a weak argument. And so we wanted to make the RNA in some way artificially so that it had never seen the inside of a tetrahymena cell and test that RNA to see if uh, it could still undergo this uh, rearrangement, this RNA splicing, cutting and pasting reaction. So the question is, if we make RNA in a very artificial way, will it still undergo this self-splicing? To do this, we turned to what at the time was a fairly new field of genetic engineering or recombinant DNA manipulations. We took a portion of the gene that encoded uh, both the intron and some of the flanking coding sequences or exons of the DNA, uh, took that fragment and put it in a circular uh, piece of bacterial DNA called a plasmid, so that when this is reintroduced into the bacterium E. coli, it is replicated along with the bacterial chromosome, and one can get a large amount of a very uh, defined circular piece of DNA to be produced. We then extracted the DNA from the bacterium and added purified RNA polymerase, this enzyme which copies DNA into RNA, to transcribe now this artificial shortened version that contained a part of the exons and the entire intron. We then removed the one protein that had been adding the well-characterized RNA polymerase and added the uh, magnesium ion and the GTP under conditions where splicing had pre we had previously found the splicing to take place. And that RNA chain was now cut apart and the two distant sites ligated or uh, bonded together and the intron removed at exactly the same sites where the splicing took place in the living cell. And that was important because this, at this point, this was a very artificial test tube reaction, and we needed some assurance that this, was, this process was relevant to biology and the fact that the specificity of site selection had been retained gave us that confidence. So at this point, it seemed that the RNA by itself, this RNA, and for all we knew, perhaps other RNAs, would had the ability to form an active site and speed up, catalyze without the active site itself being changed, a very specific, a ve very specific biochemical reaction. In other words, it looked like RNA could be a catalyst. Perhaps RNA could be an enzyme. And to us, that was a very exciting um, finding in basic cell or molecular biology or biochemistry, but unknown to us, there was a whole other group of people out there who had been waiting for this discovery. So this is, as you can see, Campbell's primordial soup. There were a group of scientists unknown to us who had been asking the question, how did life originate on the planet Earth? And they had come up with uh, a bit of a dilemma. If you think about simple prebiotic life form has to uh, be able to be replicated. It has to reproduce itself. One generation has to give rise to subsequent generations. That seems absolutely fundamental to calling something a life or a, a living form. Well, 
how do we have reproduction in current biological systems? Well, you need to have the molecule that is going to carry the information that is going to uh, be reproduced. So you need to have an informational molecule. In modern cells, that means a nucleic acid. But at the same time, it was thought that nucleic acids were inert, that they simply stored information. And in order to be copied, you had to have protein enzymes to catalyze the assembly of another copy of the informational molecule. So if you need to have both the information and the function at the same time, if you need to have both the nucleic acid and the protein to provide the catalysis of reproduction, then which came first, the nucleic acid or the protein? It's sometimes called the chicken and the egg problem of early evolution. Well, now that we know that one of these molecules, namely RNA, can both carry information and can be a biocatalyst, maybe there's a tremendous simplifying uh, scenario, which is that at the beginning there might have been RNA, or perhaps RNA is too complicated, perhaps you need some even simpler uh, uh, predecessor to RNA to act as both informational molecule and to catalyze its own reproduction. So how do you test that sort of, a, of an idea? You can't go into the laboratory and do an experiment to say how did life originate on the earth four billion years ago? That's a historical question. I guess I can speculate about it because I'm wearing my historian's sweater. But you can go into the laboratory and ask the question, is it feasible that such reactions could take place? Can you uh, reproduce in the laboratory some of the individual steps that would take place? And at least ask the question, is it, or answer the question, is it plausible? Which still, of course, doesn't tell you whether that's the way that it really took place. And so uh, this has been done, some work uh, on it in my own laboratory, and also in Jack Shostak's laboratory in Boston. The sort of scheme for ribozyme self-replication that can be envisioned and, in fact, can be tested in the laboratory starts out in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, imagine a double helical RNA molecule with one strand uh, paired with its complement. And now in the, uh, let's say, in the heat of the uh, midday desert sun in a small uh, pool of water, the uh, weak hydrogen bonding connecting the two strands is disrupted and each strand separates and then, then in the cool of the night uh, they can each fold up into their own individual structure and the top strand, the red one, uh, is one of these ribozymes that has the ability, ribozyme is the word we use for a catalytic RNA molecule, the ribo comes from ribonucleic acid, the zyme is like an enzyme. This particular catalytic RNA has the ability to catalyze the joining of short scraps of RNA on an RNA template. So the green strand, the complementary strand, can serve as a template. Random oligonucleotides, and it's been shown that um, the constituent parts of a nucleotide can be readily synthesized in reactions that just involve gases that would be found uh, in the, on the primitive earth, such as um, uh, ammonia, uh, uh, carbon dioxide, water, um, as, as uh, building blocks, and then in the presence of energy that could come from an electrical discharge like lightning or uh, ultraviolet light from, from the sun that you can, that uh, some of the building blocks of the nucleic acids as well as the amino acids uh, form rather readily. And so if these are random uh, sequence, random means that the order of A's, G's, C's and U's is not being predetermined but it's simply random, uh, th they will line up on this uh, complementary RNA simply by according to their ability to base pair. And then in the presence of the ribozyme, these individual short pieces can be stitched together. The process can continue until after one cycle, we're back to having 
uh, double-stranded RNA, but you can see that we haven't used up the red strand. So we've gone from uh, a red strand plus a green strand, and after one round, we have a red and a green and an additional red strand. If in a subsequent cycle, the red strand can use another copy of itself, another red strand as a template, then in two cycles, we could have doubled the starting material or reproduced the nucleic acid. And a lot of the individual steps in this hypothetical replication cycle have been reproduced in the laboratory, although at the current time, getting a self-perpetuating RNA replication system that will just go on and on producing uh, more and more of itself has not been achieved. We, we can ask uh, a different, we can apply a different sort of test to whether this is a likely sort of scenario. We can ask the question, is there any evidence in our own cells, in our body, or in other uh, organisms that are present today that might be consistent with uh, an early role for RNA in uh, prebiotic evolution. And these are called molecular fossils. They're very different from the sort of fossils that paleontologists talk about. That sort of a physical fossil has been preserved because it's been uh, mineralized, in other words, turned to stone. Those sorts of fossils are very good for preserving the exterior surface of animals or even very primitive cells that date to over three billion years old. But as far as we know, that sort of a physical fossil cannot be formed of an individual molecule. They're simply too small and too fragile. So instead, these molecular fossils, this term is used for a molecule found in contemporary cells that's found in every cell that's examined, from bacteria to humans and the so-called archaebacteria, it's found in all kingdoms, such that it's thought that it must have been there at the common progenitor to all of contemporary life. And when we look uh, at such molecules, we find that protein enzymes very often carry around with them involved in their active site chemistry, molecules called nucleotide coenzymes. These consist of a green portion in each case, which is one of the uh, building blocks of ribonucleic acid. And attached to it is another entity, which in some cases also uh, looks rather similar, but a little different from one of the building blocks of RNA. So the presence of these nucleotide coenzymes in current biology may be giving us a hint of uh, the primordial importance of ribonucleic acid according to the following sort of scene, scenario. Uh, that we might have uh, at the beginning had these RNA enzymes, these ribozymes, uh, as serving as biological catalysts before there were any protein catalyst to, to be used. Uh, even from very early times, there would be short scraps of proteinaceous material, strings of amino acids produced by random chemical uh, condensation events. And these, any RNA molecule or ribozyme that could bind and utilize one of these little pieces of protein uh, from its environment to either enhance its uh, activity or to change its specificity in a, in a way that, that made it a better catalyst uh, could then uh, work as a ribonucleoprotein enzyme. But an important step would occur when RNA encoded protein synthesis had evolved. At that point, RNA molecules that could encode a protein which could come back and bind to them um, and enhance their activity or, or give them activity in a new sort of reaction would uh, be selected. And so you can see that at this point, uh, the sort of relative importance of the RNA is shrinking and the protein is becoming more important in catalysis. And finally, we come to the modern uh, day where enzymes are mostly, except with the exception of 
of those that are ribozymes. Most enzymes in current cells are certainly proteins, but they ca often carry along with them one of these nucleotide coenzymes, which perhaps is a molecular fossil, uh, giving us reason to believe that all of them originally came from an RNA ancestor. I think a fascinating possibility, but of course one that's very hard to go into the laboratory and test. Now it turned out that there was a, a possible spin-off of the discovery that RNA could be a catalyst in a very different direction uh, other than the origins of life. And this has to do with the uh, medical or pharmaceutical arena, and that's what I'd like to address next. I'd like to go back to a slide that I already showed you uh, that RNA catalysts have the ability to recognize other RNA molecules shown in pink and that once this complex is formed, the ribozyme can catalyze the cutting of the pink RNA chain without itself being damaged so that one ribozyme can cycle through uh, this process an indefinite number of times. Now, why would this be of any possible medical interest? So, does any of you know, I'll ask the audience, do you know of a pink RNA chain that uh, someone interested in, in uh, curing disease might be interested in inactivating? Back there. Oh, the yes. Excuse me? The virus. A virus was the answer, and that's certainly a good answer. Do you know of any viruses that are themselves made out of <laughs> RNA, where the RNA is actually the heart of the virus? AIDS is a retrovirus. So AIDS is one example. The HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, is a, a, a coated or an enveloped uh, piece of RNA, actually two pieces of RNA per virion. So that's one example. Did you have another example here? Turns out if you guys take a wild guess, you're probably going to be right because many of the inf viral infections that plague us, including uh, flu, including the common cold, polio, uh, these are all RNA viruses. And even in those cases where the genetic material inside the virus is DNA instead of RNA, those viruses have to produce, that they go through this same uh, pathway, DNA makes RNA makes protein, so they produce specific viral RNAs at the subsequent step. So independent of whether you have an, a DNA virus or an RNA virus, there would be a RNA target with it, which is specific to the virus and not found in healthy human cells, which one would like to uh, destroy. And it turns out that cutting the RNA chain, it's then very quickly um, degraded inside of cells. So, so disrupting the continuity of the RNA chain in most cases is sufficient to completely inactivate its activity. Now, there are another set of diseases in which uh, a virus is, is not involved. This could be a bacterial or a fungal infection, or it could be something like cancer, where normal cellular genetic processes have gone awry. But even in those cases, almost always, there are specific RNAs which are being produced in a mutated form or which are being produced in an inappropriate amount or at an inappropriate time for a particular cell and causing the rampant proliferation of cells that we know as cancer. So the interest in cutting and thereby knocking out specific RNAs is not restricted to the viral diseases. Let's see how this might work. Um, you can design one of these small ribozymes called a hammerhead ribozyme to recognize and pair with uh, virtually any target RNA that you might wish to destroy. Why is this called a hammerhead? And please don't blame me for the name. This was uh, a very imaginative name uh, that was invented by an Australian uh, by the name of Bob Simons who worked on, on this system uh, first. And uh, it's called a hammerhead because you can envision this to look sort of like uh, a carpenter's hammer 
This is the handle of the hammer. This would be the head of the hammer and sort of the claw of the hammer back here. So it's sort of standing uh, upside down. Uh, we were all disappointed when we heard this was supposed to be a carpenter's hammer. Since Simons was from Australia, we had been thinking of the hammerhead sharks on the Great Barrier Reef, and this seemed uh, much less exciting to have this RNA named after a simple carpenter's hammer. In any case, uh, if you have a, uh, a target RNA or substrate RNA, which you wish to design a hammerhead to, to uh, interact with, we simply use the rules of Watson-Crick complementary base pairing to uh, choose a sequence on these arms in the position shown as an N prime to pair with the sequence on, that is adjacent to a, a G followed by a U, which of course would occur very commonly in RNA, about once every 16 nucleotides, uh, and so that this complex can form in a specific way. So you could all be ribozyme engineers very um, easily. So for example, if there's a, a, an A present in the substrate, what do you put across from it in the ribozyme? A U. Some of you said T. Well, if it was DNA, it'd be T. But for RNA, U is the equivalent of T. If there's a G in the target RNA, you put a C opposite it. If there's a C in the target, you put a G opposite it. And so, uh, very simple and very unusual in uh, the pharmaceutical industry to be able to design a drug for one disease and then in a few minutes with pencil and paper retool that drug to be targeted against a different disease by simply knowing which RNA one would have to knock out in order to alleviate the disease symptoms. So once this complementary base pairing uh, results in the assembly of the complex between the ribozyme and its target, then the nucleotides shown in the boxed region wrap up around this site, and in the presence of, again, a metal ion, the uh, chain is broken. Now, let's go back to the idea of an HIV or retroviral infection as being one possible, um, uh, one possible target for this sort of technology. And this is, in fact, one that is being very heavily pursued in quite a number of academic and biotechnology laboratories. So the retrovirus, which contains the two strands of RNA uh, covered with protein and, and an envelope that includes uh, uh, lipid material as well, attaches to a, a lymphocyte, a, a blood cell, and the uh, RNA is uh, released inside of the cell. At this point, if one had a ribozyme directed to specifically recognize that blue retroviral RNA, uh, th they can form a complex, and then you can see the little scissors is supposed to evoke the idea that that RNA, blue RNA, will then be cut. Uh, once the RNA is converted or reverse transcribed into a DNA copy, which is then integrated into a human chromosome, it would, of course, be uh, unavailable for ribozyme cleavage. But then in order for the in infectious cycle to continue, the DNA needs to be copied or transcribed into two kinds of RNA, both more RNA genomes, which are the, the ones that are going to end up being packaged into the retrovirus, but also specific messenger RNAs, which make the proteins which either uh, are involved in the viral refs replication cycle inside the cell or are forming the coat that coats the viral RNA to lead to the budding off of additional infectious particles. And either these genomic RNAs or these specific messenger RNAs, again, are targets for ribozyme intervention. So where are we with this technology? Well, it works extremely well in the test tube, where you can control the concentration of ribozyme relative to RNA. When you try to get this to work on individual human cells growing in culture, there have been quite a number of reports of success, although once you get into a real living cell situation, it becomes much more difficult. And one expects that it's going to be yet 
more difficult to go to an actual infected human. Uh, there are clinical trials of ribozyme therapy for uh, HIV that have been approved but have not yet been started in uh, Southern California area. And so it's going to be, I think, still a number of years before we can see how well this works uh, in terms of intervent intervening with an actual uh, virus infection uh, because clinical trials have to be carried out uh, over, uh, in a very careful and safe way over usually a fairly prolonged period of time. Uh, of course, the big problem with this sort of therapy is the delivery problem. This, these ribozymes, even though this particular one is a fairly small RNA compared with other cellular RNAs, it is still considerably larger than traditional pharmaceuticals. Uh, most drug companies go after chemicals that are under 500 in molecular weight. And if you think about that in terms of RNA, with 330 uh, mass units per nucleotide, you can see you can only get one and a half nucleotides of RNA and stay under this 500 um, molecular weight uh, limit. And so uh, clearly you need to uh, have a much larger drug if you're going to use RNA compared to a more conventional pharmaceutical agent. Uh, now, in the last uh, couple of years, a postdoctoral fellow, Bruce Sullinger, who now has his an independent faculty position at Duke University in North Carolina, has come up with a rather different way of using ribozymes to intervene in human disease. And this is using not the cutting activity of ribozymes alone, but instead the splicing activity, the ability to add another uh, portion of RNA to attach two RNA molecules together. And Solinger's idea uh, is that in many cases, an RNA molecule in the cell, you don't so much want to eliminate it, but it's mutated, and you want to, in principle, correct that defect in the RNA. Well, what would be an example of that? Well, there are many genetic diseases, including sickle cell anemia, where there's a mutation in one of the chains of the hemoglobin protein molecule that carries oxygen through the bloodstream. There's uh, other examples such as cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy where RNAs are still being made, but the RNA has a mutation in it because the DNA from which in the chromosome from which it was transcribed has a mutation. So the idea then is to design a ribozyme of this self-splicing type, but to uh, one that has a, a portion of it which can recognize a sequence on the mutant transcript that is preceding the damaged or mutant portion. And then this ribozyme, which we call a trans-splicing ribozyme, also uh, ca carries with it a downstream or three-prime exon, which is uh, uh, corrected, has this defect in the mutant transcript fixed. You can see the WT stands for wild type, which means that's the natural version that you would like to have that would correct the genetic deficiency at the RNA level. And now, if these two can get together in cells, the ribozyme will catalyze the cutting off of the undesired or mutant portion of the transcript and the attachment of the correct portion. Uh, as shown down below, and this RNA uh, should now be functional. Well, this technology works very well in the test tube, and we've also tried it in living cells, uh, not mammalian cells, but E. coli, the bacterium, and are able to uh, engineer a system in which we can take a, a, a defective, non-working RNA transcript and make a, a, a corrected uh, RNA out of it. You can think of this as sort of a molecular repair kit for fixing bad RNAs. You're simultaneously out with the bad and in with the good. There, of course, are many challenges uh, that need to be overcome in order to make something of uh, potential clinical usefulness from this basic science, and those include increasing the efficiency of the uh, splicing, which right now is rather inefficient, 
getting very high specificity to occur inside of living cells where there are a very large number of different RNAs that could potentially be rearranged by such a trans-splicing ribozyme. And then uh, finally, the delivery problem again, and I think that's going to hinge on developments in gene therapy. These, these trans-splicing ribozymes are certainly going to be too large to be added, to be given to uh, a patient as a drug. It's going, they're going to have to be delivered in the form of delivering DNA, which then will be copied into RNA in the human cells, copied into this sort of trans-splicing ribozyme, which can uh, correct uh, transcripts from mutant genes. So uh, some exciting things to think about in the, in the future. I'm supposed to go to questions now, but I think it would be worth just a minute for me to recap uh, what I've uh, gone over in this second lecture. I told you a story, the story about uh, the discovery of the first catalytic RNA molecule, and I hope you saw that there was a lot of serendipity involved in that discovery that we uh, did not go looking for RNA catalysts, but in a sense, the RNA catalysts came looking for us, and we simply had to keep our eyes open at the right time. And then I told you that that basic science discovery had spin-offs in directions which were not at all on our mind at the time we were doing those experiments. We were driven by our curiosity to try to understand a life process unknown to us. There would be excitement generated both in the area of origins of life possibilities and also in the area of new approaches uh, for in medicine intervention in both viral disease but also non-viral disease coming from this, uh, uh, what started out as the serendipitous discovery in basic research. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for another great lecture. Tomorrow morning will be the final two lectures given by Dr. Check in this series. We thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you here tomorrow. <laughs>